Hi guys, welcome back to Swordwind. We are the Charlotte branch of the New York Historical Fencing Association, and in this video we're going to be continuing our series on basic longsword cuts with the long edge Unterhau from your uh, dominant side. What that cut looks like is this. That is uh, it's a, an ascending diagonal cut. Uh, you can throw it as well from other guards, uh, but when practicing to kind of master the mechanics of this cut, I recommend uh, practicing it from Nabenhut, which is to say um, an edge, uh, an edge threatening low guard with the point held behind you. Uh, just to look at that from a different angle. Uh, so a couple of things to notice about this cut, um, we've discussed this a little bit in our just kind of body mechanics uh, fu fundamentals playlist, uh, but here to make it more explicit. Uh, the first thing is my grip. My default cutting grip has not changed, so I've got that uh, nice kind of vertical palm orientation with the narrow edge of my grip right between the two pads of meat at the base of my palm, and then I just curl my fingers around the, uh, around the handle. Similarly with my bottom hand, I lower my sword down into Albert here, and then I turn it to my rear. Uh, now I want to get as close to directly behind me with this guard as I can uh, to simplify the number of things that could go wrong with it. That is to say, I'm holding Naven Hut down here and not out here to the side. Uh, I'm going to back up just in case the camera can't see that well. Here, uh, not here, but here. Now that does mean that I am turning my body uh, until I am almost side on to the opponent. That is fine. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because just as an overhaul uh, is really a very steep vertical, uh, is really a very steep descending cut, so um, your long edge unterhaul is a very steep rising cut. So I don't want to be off to the side and cutting it like this. I want to be, uh, I want to be basically uh, in in something close to a vertical plane so that I can cut up like this. The, so uh, there's the, the other thing that this helps with is edge alignment. Uh, a lot of people run into trouble with Unterhau because they can't their edge too much to, uh, too much to the side. This, you want to think edge up while you're cutting this, uh, while you're making this cut. Now, obviously I'm going from the right side of my body to the left side of my body. So there is a diagonal motion there. There's no other way for me to get from right to left. But if I am thinking too much about the diagonal, my experience teaching students uh, to make this cut is that they end up doing this. Uh, and they just sort of kind of bite into the target a little bit and then um, try and push with their flat through the rest of it, which obviously doesn't work. So rather than thinking about the diagonal aspect of it, uh, I recommend that people think about the vertical aspect of, or, or um, uh, the, uh, the, the vertical aspect of the cut. Um, going down the line, other things that can go wrong with this cut. One of the big ones, uh, and one of the reasons why it is especially useful, um, even as an early KDF practitioner, um, to use this, uh, to practice this cut, is that it makes a lot of demands on your finger squeeze. Um, if your fingers, so obviously my point is uh, pointed back here. If I just raise my hands into position, then my sword ends up doing this, and I end up sort of contacting the target here, and then just sort of smearing the weak of my sword across the target, which will uh, literally make a laceration, but it does not, uh, it does not inflict uh, a very forceful hue, which is what we are going for. So I need to pay extra, extra attention because I'm fighting gravity that my tip is not dragging behind my hands. By that I mean I've cast my hands this far forward and my tip is still way back there. What I want is something closer to this, where the tip is in line, is 
uh, in line or closer to in line with where my hands are as they travel. How do I do that, uh, given that my point starts back with the finger squeeze? So uh, I'm gonna do this with just the finger squeeze, which means my sword is going to contact the ground. Uh, for purposes of this demonstration, that's fine. This is important uh, in order to kick that tip out. Now, if I do combine that with the hip twist and casting my hands forward, then the tip travels the tip travels forward at the start of the hue, and then uh, I finish the rise. That means when I contact my target, I'm going to be much closer to a, uh, a perpendicular orientation, and I can cleave through them like I should be doing with this type of blade, as opposed to uh, biting it, as opposed to biting in kind of uh, superficially, and then making a long but very shallow um, draw cut. The, um, while we're on the subject of what our hands are doing, um, don't forget that your opponent is still in front of you. So one of the one of the other ways that this hue oftentimes goes wrong is that people cast it up, but they forget to cast it forward. So they might do something like this, as opposed to this. Um, what you want to think, uh, my, my advice for that is that while you want to think of your edge orientation in terms of being up, um, with the long edge always turned upward, as Pseudo von Danzig says, uh, you want to think about the overall kind of direction that you are, uh, direction that you are projecting your offensive energy, if that's not too, uh, too mystical, um, or the direction that your hands are going as forward. Um, your opponent's over there, and it obviously just for tactical reasons you want this hue to go as far forward as possible. Uh, for mechanical reasons as well though, if you think too much up, um, my experience is that you tend to, uh, is that uh, a student who's thinking too much up with their cut will tend to compromise the edge, uh, the edge orientation relative to the target. That is to say, when you go up, and I'm going to exaggerate this, you tend to sort of uh, be, you tend to sort of uh, surrender or uh, compromise that kicking that tip forward as we just discussed. Whereas if you think forward, then the tip uh, tends to get kicked out as it should. In addition, of course, as I said, to the tactical considerations. Um, so we've talked so far about having our, our nice strong finger squeeze to start with here so that we hit perpendicular, not just the smearing. We've talked about keeping the edge up, not trying to kind of overcorrect, not thinking diagonal and sort of overcorrecting into uh, an overly horizontal edge orientation. And we've talked about casting the hue forward as opposed to casting the hue up. Now that said, uh, you'll notice that I am ending, even when I cast the hue forward, you'll notice I'm ending in an ox, uh, in a variant of ox that has the whole sword over my shoulder. And obviously this is not directly threatening my opponent's face. That is fine. Uh, the reason that is fine is because we need to focus uh, on our, when we are cutting, we need to focus on make, making that first cut first, and then we can concern ourselves with uh, bringing our point in line. So if I do this and I miss, then yes, I can bring my point back online to threaten my opponent's face. I can flip over into something that's a, an ox that's a little more protective uh, of my fingers to threaten my opponent's face, but I would not want to end the hue in this position. The reason for that is because now I have, as, as I slant my tip in towards my opponent's face, I am letting my tip drag. Uh, so what I am doing there is I am basically compromising the hue in order to have a more effective follow-up, um, which is to say I am basically planning for my hue to not end the fight because I am casting it 
uh, with less force than I need to in anticipation of what comes next. And of course, if I cast my hue with less force than I need to, and it does connect, um, then what could have ended the fight will not. So finish that hue um, with the blade pointed forward, even, even if that is not actually uh, pointed at your opponent, and then correct uh, if your opponent is still in the game. The uh, now that that point forward orientation is uh, in contrast both to this kind of hanging um, end point. It is also in contrast to this end point, which uh, you will see people do sometimes in competition. This is uh, not a guard at all um, in any system that I'm aware of, but it is kind of the natural end point of somebody really swinging for the fences and. Um, uh, because they don't trust their mechanics enough to get through uh, uh, to get through the target ending here. Uh, from a tactical perspective, the problem with this is that it takes much longer to get your point back online than it does if you end point forward. Um, now that's not to uh, from a mechanical perspective, um, this is basically just a test of skill. The question is, can't, do you need to swing so much that you kind of overswing into this sort of vertical movie poster-like position? Um, or are the rest of your mechanics good enough that you can end here and still have made a successful cut? Um, now that's not to say, um, especially for some of the kind of loopier longsword systems, that you couldn't cut and let this flow around into something else. That is. A, uh, there are many circumstances in which that's absolutely an appropriate tactical choice. Uh, and one of the advantages of that, uh, that sort of motion is that it lets you swing, uh, it sort of lets you swing for the fences because you don't end here, you just pass through it on your way to some other motion. Um, if that is the way that you are fighting, uh, then that is fine. As a matter of practice, I recommend challenging yourself to see, can I make a successful Unterhau ending point forward? Um, just to kind of push, uh, push your mechanics to be that much better. So uh, now we've talked about end point uh, and kind of ways that that can go wrong, either point too much down or point too much up. Uh, in between that, of course, would be something like this, which is uh, uh, all, of the, all of the remarks I just made about this kind of position apply to this sort of Einhorn-like position. Uh, it's not necessarily wrong if it fits into the overall context of your fencing. Uh, it is a crutch in terms of your uh, practice of mastering this hue to not end uh, point forward in ox. The, um, so now we've talked a lot about what our hands are doing, what our arms are doing, let's talk about what the rest of the body is doing. Uh, for one thing, uh, you'll notice I'm trying to keep my torso uh, nice and upright throughout the whole hue. Uh, now there, there is a sometimes a tendency when you're in Nabenhut kind of lean over, um, and so, uh, especially people who have a golfing experience, I find, tend to do this. There's also a tendency sometimes when you cast the hue up for people to sort of lean over uh, that way as if to counterbalance uh, the fact that they've got this great three pound weight on their left side. Both of those um, are to be avoided, and the reason for it is because I want to keep the uh, axis of rotation nice and straight from the top of my head all the way down uh, to the ground, so that when my hips, the axis that my hips are rotating around is the same axis that my shoulders are rotating around. If I am le leaned over, then my hips are still rotating sort of in this axis, but my shoulders are now rotating in this axis. Uh, and I've sort of broken the power train, as it were, of my hue. That's true whether I start here or whether I start 
uh, whether I start upright, but then as I cast the cue, I lean over. Um, this is something that it is, just as a practice note, it is often difficult to notice yourself doing. I'm trying to exaggerate it uh, for the camera so people can see what I'm talking about, but it's worth uh, practicing this in a mirror or with a partner who can be, uh, who can be critical of you, because oftentimes in practice what this looks like is this. Uh, I'm leaned over right now. I know I'm leaned over because I kind of told my body to do that, but um, if I was focusing on the cut, I might not even notice that I had leaned that, um, that small amount. But that small amount will make a very material difference in your ability to, um, to make this cut successfully. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of the rotation, uh, the axis of rotation uh, being nice uh, and centered here in my core, uh, hopefully it goes without saying at this point for people that have been following this channel, that the real uh, power generation here comes from the hips. Now I do need to use my arms, obviously, to raise the sword, um, but just as with an overhaul, I want to keep my arms as loose as possible while fully extending them. With an unterhaul, I want to keep my arms loose while extending and raising them. The real like kind of whipping power does not come from my biceps and triceps, it comes from my hips. Um, that's a delicate balance to get right. Uh, obviously you need muscle tone to raise the sword, but if you tense these muscles up, uh, your, your arm muscles up as, you're, uh, as you are raising the sword, then you're going to find that that actually slows down uh, the whip of the blade through the target, it slows down and it um, slows, it messes with your ability to track. So um, that's another way in which this cue is mechanically more challenging than an, than an overhaul. And even for systems uh, like early KDF where this is not used very much, uh, it's a good reason to practice this to kind of master your own body uh, and its relation to the sword. So I'm trying to keep my arms as loose as possible. I squeeze, I turn my hips and I cast this forward. You'll, uh, I don't know if you can see, I'm, tr I'm basically using the minimum uh, muscle tension I can in my arms while still getting the sword up to that point. If I do that more at speed, then the real explosive movement is here in the hips, the arms, um, the arms explode kind of as little as possible in order to keep them as loose as possible so that they are transmitting the power that I'm generating from my lower body but not trying to uh, not, not trying to generate on their own. Uh, now in terms of kind of body positioning, you'll notice I'm starting here in Nabenhood almost side on to my uh, almost side on to my opponent. By the time I end, I am looking at my opponent. You'll also notice that my hips uh, are not square on. They have rotated past the center line, off to the left. Uh, that is because in order to keep, uh, in order to maximize my skeletal structure support for the hue, I want my center line to be pointed at this spot between my hands, at least from the moment that I contact the target and all the way through. Obviously, I am not starting centered here, uh, no more than I would start centered in Vomtog. I wouldn't try to do this. Um, neither would I try to line up the center line with that spot between my hands here uh, in Nabenhut. But, so the sword actually comes forward faster than my hips turn, uh, and it's my finger squeeze mostly that does that. By the time I get to about here, I am centered. I hit my target, still centered. I carry through, still centered. Uh, that centering, uh, kind of matching that centering up and then maintaining it as you track through the target is an important part of this hue. Uh, it's something that this hue also tends to make you think about, again, more than you need to think about it uh, when you were throwing an overhaul. The, um, 
Now finally, let's talk about kind of what my legs are doing. You'll notice that I am, although I am twisting my hips, I am not turning my back heel. Uh, I'm gonna back up again, just in case the camera can't see my foot. All right, so what I am not doing is this. Uh, I am certainly not doing this, kind of coming up on my toes uh, like an arabesque. Um, if you've been following this channel, you might uh, have guessed the reasons for that. Um, the reason I'm not coming up uh, on my toe is because I want to stay as grounded as possible when my sword hits a resistive target in order to, again, provide maximum support for the hue as it goes through. Uh, the reason I'm not twisting my heel, right, twisting my heel like this does maintain contact with the ground, but you'll see that it lowers my body. And I don't want to be lowering my body at the same time as I am casting my sword up through a target. That is, um, the sword is moving up, but the whole platform that the sword is attached to, namely me, is moving down. So I'm actually working against my heel if I twist my, if I twist that heel so that I am falling as my sword is going up. Uh, this is sort of the same thing that uh, the equivalent of rise, popping up, uh, popping up on your knees or on the balls of your feet when you cast an overhow, right? You want to stay grounded when you cast an overhow, not do this, um, moving the platform up as your sword is going down. So I keep this back foot planted. It does not move as I... Uh, as I make the hue. Now, the knee should be, uh, the knee, sometimes uh, when people turn their hips, they want to kind of break their knee in like this. There's, um, that's not an enormous mechanical sin in terms of the effect it will have on your hue. Um, you're not going to be supporting your hue as much with a, a, a bent knee like this as you would with a straight knee. Um, so it's certainly not good. Uh, more to the point, I think it's to be avoided because you, uh, this is just bad for your knee. So keep your knee pointed, uh, let's see, my knee's pointed basically in line with my foot. Uh, so if my foot, my back foot was pointed forward, my knee would be pointed forward. Uh, my back foot tends to be pointed about 45 degrees off to the side. So that is where my knee is going. And as I, and I'm turning my hips, not trying to turn my knees. That way my knee uh, maintains its alignment and I'm not constantly kind of uh, putting weird, awkward torsion on that joint as I throw the heel. So uh, just kind of back up, reiterate a little bit. We've talked about uh, we've talked about not leaning, not leaning forward uh, at the start of the hue, not leaning at the end of the hue to try and counterbalance. We've talked about making sure that we are centered as we hit and as we track through the target. We've talked about keeping our knee, our our feet uh, planted not turning up and not screwing down into the ground. And we've talked about keeping our knee in line with our foot, not bending it in awkwardly like this. Uh, last thing I wanna talk about in terms of kind of ways that this um, cut can go wrong is back to the hands and their orientation on the handle. When I make this cut, I'm gonna turn here. You can see there is an actual angle between my back forearm and the handle. That is to say, I am not trying to do this, uh, where my forearm is kind of in line with the handle. This is really awkward on the hand, and it breaks, it overly pronates the wrist. Um, and this, this is, again, sort of the equivalent of ending an Oberhau with really bent wrists like this. I don't want to end an Unterhau with, re with a really bent wrist either. I want both arms to be, uh, I want both arms to be at an angle to the handle and nice and fully extended, not with a bent elbow and a bent wrist back here. The, um, 
that's one of the ways that I see this hue go wrong sometimes is people will cut like this. Um, and as with cutting, uh, as with cutting with a bent arm in an overhow, that also tends to draw back the hue. So rather than going entirely forward, I'm going forward and then pulling back a, uh, just a little bit. I exaggerated uh, it there for the camera. Hopefully you guys could see that. Um, now again, kind of, to kind of, uh, just to make clear what I am saying and not saying about hands on the pommel, bent arms and so forth. I am not saying that you couldn't hold ox like this, uh, right? Uh, I sometimes hold ox like this myself with my hand, my palm, fully gripping the pommel because this is a nice and powerful position to thrust from. It is simply not a good position to end a cut in. Um, if I do it without the sword, this is the difference between ending in this position, uh, where my arm is uh, fairly strong and neutral, and ending my cut in this position, um, which without a sword in my hand, hopefully you can see this is just an awkward, uh, not very well supported position. Um, so um, we've talked now about our grip, edge orientation, we've talked about casting the hue forward instead of just raking it up, we've talked about ending in this point forward position, not point down and not point up, we've talked about keeping our torso nice and straight, not leaned over like a golfer, not trying to counterbalance uh, the hue. We have tr talked about keeping the foot planted, not arabesquing or screwing into the ground. We have talked about keeping the knee straight, not bent in, but straight. And we've talked about keeping our hands, uh, our arms nice and straight uh, as we would with any, uh, as we would with any hue, not bent like this. Uh, and finally, of course, we've talked about keeping ourselves uh, centered as we hit, as we track, and as we end. So how does all of this work with a, with a step? You'll notice that I have been doing this from Nabenhut with no step, um, as, we always, uh, as we always in NIFA begin our hewing practice. Uh, my non-dominant foot is forward, my sword is on my dominant side, and that creates this nice kind of safe open space for me to cut through without the risk of like running into this foot, for instance, if I were to cut like this. Um, um, it's interesting that in the pseudo von Danzig gloss, um, in the uh, in the, the in the Verker section, we are actually told uh, to hew to make a long edge uh, a long edge Unterhau with the left foot always leading uh, as a way uh, as a way of kind of leading into that play. That's very unusual for early KDF to make a cut to make a cut while moving without taking a passing step. Um, if that is the case, then um, kind of following the general advice to follow your hue, follow uh, your hue with a step, the order of operations re re basically remains the same. I'm going to start my hue with the finger squeeze take my step, make sure I've finished my step so I am grounded before I actually hit my target. After I finish that, then I can continue to move up. Squeeze, start the step, finish the step, finish the hue. Start the hue and then, uh, and then recover. Start the hue, start the step, finish the step, finish the hue, bring myself back up. Um, that is not the only way that you can throw a neuter how while moving though. You can absolutely do it while taking a passing step. The, there is a small risk here because your dominant foot is moving forward at the same time as your dominant, as the sword is moving on your dominant side, that you will hit your foot. Um, it, is, it is a small risk. Um, it is large enough that uh, most cutting tournaments uh, won't let you cut this way, um, but 
uh, while moving, uh, while taking a step to get into position, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, and one of the advantages of it, uh, well, there are two advantages of it. One is that it does end you uh, in a well-supported ox with my right foot forward and my sword on my left side, as opposed to taking it without a step, which ends me in a less well-supported ox. My sword is on my left side and my left foot is, uh, is extended. The other thing it does is uh, allow the hips to rotate through their arc a little more naturally because I'm not trying to rotate over this advanced uh, this advanced leg. Here, um, as as with any uh, passing step in a hue in early KDF, again we're following the same basic order of operations. I start the hue with the finger squeeze. I start the step. I finish the step. I finish the hue uh, a little less mechanistically like that. Right. I don't need to start, step, and then twist, um, obviously. If I am trying to drill into my body the correct order of operations, that is literally what I will do. I will go one, two, three, and I'll just keep doing this a little bit faster each time until it becomes nice and smooth. Um, the goal being that your sword is moving as far forward as possible uh, in order to present the greatest threat to the opponent without hitting your opponent before your, for before your step has settled onto the ground. So bad would be one, two, now go. Better, uh, also bad would be throw the hue, hit the target, finish the step, finish through. That means that I'm trying to track through in this position. Uh, ideally, I am right here. I finish my step. I'm like a millimeter away from con entering my target's body. And then I can track through with a fully grounded foundation. Uh, I'm going to append to this video examples of this cut uh, of this cut in test cutting, both with a step and without a step. I hope that this has been helpful for you guys, and we'll see you uh, next time looking at Unterhau, a long edge Unterhau from your non-dominant side. Until then, thanks very much, and thanks for watching.